recording started. Good day. This is the recorded lecture for Chapter 19 that looks at conventional energy, and it's scheduled for week 14 of the class. I remember clearly one of the greatest oil spills that occurred in 1989. That was the Exxon Valdez spill. I remember the ongoing news reports, the long debate about what happened, how it happened, the cleanup experience, and also the many reports afterward about lessons learned for the spill and how the area recovered from that spill. This spill, which is a major spill and a major news story at the time, was dwarfed by the April 20th, 20, 2010 Deepwater Horizon accident and spill, as you are all pretty familiar with, I suspect. So let's review the history of the spill. A contractor for BP was drilling the Macondo well in the Gulf of Mexico just off the Louisiana coast when it, when it exploded, burned, and sank. The well was nearly a mile down um, deep in the Gulf, about 1,600 meters if you look at that distance, and had reached oil at a depth of about 13,360 feet below the seafloor. <clears throat> a, a bubble of methane gas shot up through the drill pipe, expanding quickly as it rose and bursting into flame when it reached the surface. The seals and the safety barriers designed to prevent escaping gas failed. After burning for about a day, the $560 million drill rig capsized and sank. Eleven workers were killed and 17 others were injured. Crude oil gushed out of the, the ruptured drill pipe. BP, the company that owned the well, claimed the spill was about 5,000 barrels per day, but other, others said it was at least 10 times as much. Despite a number of efforts by BP to cap the well or to inject heavy drilling mud to stop the flow, oil continued to pour into the gulf. Finally, after four months of drilling, a relief well intersected the damaged borehole just above the spot where, at which it entered the oil reservoir. This allowed engineers to pump cement into the bottom of the well and seal it permanently. Altogether, it's estimated that about 5 million barrels of oil were released into the Gulf, making this the largest accidental marine oil spill in the world history. It was about 20 times as much oil as spilled in the wreck of the Exxon Valdez in Alaska in 1989, which I mentioned when I opened. We don't yet know the total impact of this disaster, but the effects on marine life, fishing, and tourism could be tragic and long-lasting. Six months after the spill, the Fish and Wildlife Service reported that 6,100 birds, 610 sea turtles, and 100 dolphins died from oil contamination. It's estimated that 20% of the juvenile bluefin tuna in the Gulf were killed by oil pollution in one of the species' most important spawning areas. This could be a serious blow to an already endangered population. You've probably seen many of the BP ads that are currently running on television. In an article posted by Janet McCona McConaughey, just recently posted in April of 2003, she reports that there are continuing deaths of dolphins and sea turtles. And this may be a sign that the Gulf of Mexico is still feeling the effects from this spill. Um, the, the deaths, especially dolphins, which are at the top of the food chain, are an indication that something is still amiss in the Gulf ecosystem. So the outline for this chapter is talks a little bit about energy in the first place, 
how energy is used, and it focuses on the current conventional energy sources that we use to um, power our industrial world. Before I get started on that, I included a case study that was in the previous edition of the textbook. Again, because you've probably seen some of the ads that are running on television now about clean coal and also about the natural gas industry. So um, your previous edition of the book, and it does go into this uh, later on in the section on um, coal, about uh, these types of plants that gasify coal rather than burn coal. So it produces less pollutants, air pollutants, particularly nitrous oxides, sulfur oxides, and mercury. And um, it sets up a plant for carbon sequestration, which is, allows the plant to outlet the carbon and then sequester that in some form. Um, the downside of this is um, that there are only two operating plants like this in the US, so it's not exactly like all the plants are converting to this. And there's not a single plant that actually sequesters carbon at the moment. So um, there's some uh, environmentalists that kind of question whether clean coal is really uh, possible. Um, I'll quote from um, Al Gore. Uh, clean coal is too imaginary to make a difference in protecting either our national security or our or the global climate. Indeed, those who spend hundreds of millions promoting clean coal technology consistently omit the fact that there is little investment and not a single large-scale demonstration project in the United States for capturing and safely burying all of this pollution. If the coal industry can make good on this promise, then I'm all for it. But until that day comes, we simply cannot any longer base the strategy for human survival on a cynical and self-interested illusion. So this is a chart that is figure 1910 in the new edition, I believe, that talks about this, uh, this type of technology. And again, it implies that sequestration, sequestration, that is the CO2, is outlitted and that's disposed of. But it's not. There's not a plant that actually does it. So let's look at the US fossil fuel picture. Currently, fossil fuels supply 84% of our energy needs and 88% of world needs. Um, <clears throat> gas prices are surging, as you probably are aware. And you know they now kind of hover over four dollars a gallon at times, and even higher. On average, each person uses 60 barrels of oil per year, and the U.S. spends 400 billion per year on oil imports. That's actually flat for about two decades. So you know we're not increasing our oil imports, but we're still importing a lot of oil. One of the reasons for our gas prices going up is that we're now competing with India and China for oil resources. This figure in your book, it's figure 19.2, um, looks at the relative importance of, of various fuels that we've used over the years to supply our energy in the United States. So one of the things that you can see is that the total energy that we need is, is increasing. To understand energy, we have to kind of look at how to measure it. And so I think these are important concepts. So um, it's helpful to know the units used and how to measure it. So uh, energy is, is basically work. <clears throat> and work is the application of force over distance. 
<coughs> so we measure measure work in joules. So joule a joule is the force exerted by a, a current of one amp per second flowing through a resistance of one ohm. Energy is the capacity to do work. So power is the rate of energy flow or the rate of work done. So one watt is one joule per second. If you use a 100 watt light bulb for 10 hours, you've used 1,000 watt hours or one kilowatt hour. A megawatt is one million watts. So if you run that uh, light bulb um, for a thousand hours, a hundred watt light bulb for ten times a, a thousand hours, you'll generate one megawatt. And then you can see a gigawatt, so very large um, numbers of uh, power are expressed in gigawatts. One of the things you'll notice when you look at power is we'll rate a, a power plant by the number of megawatts it produces. Produces. So, for example, if you have a, a thousand megawatt plant, that means it produces a thousand megawatts per hour of operation. A wind turbine, for example, will be rated that way. So, most of the wind turbines, the new ones we're installing now, are one or one and a half megawatt machines which means they generate one and a half megawatts per hour of operation. Um, <clears throat> so that's electricity, basically, that we're talking about. Now, gas is measured in BTUs, which is one British thermal unit. And it's the energy to heat one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit, so you can see that's an English standard. Um, we also measure oil in barrels of oil. <coughs> so, and we also measure coal in metric tons. So you can see the conversions there. So this is a table in your book, 19.2, that looks at energy uses. <coughs> Most American households use about 11,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per year. And just, just to give you an idea, the requirement for power by, the, by San Mateo County households alone combined is about 11 megawatt hours per year, so I converted it to megawatts, and that adds up to 2,820,000 roughly megawatt hours per year. So we're talking about a lot of energy here. <clears throat> so look at these different uh, energy uses of these different appliances. So what about your computers? Should you leave them on or off? Turn your laptop off and unplug the charger when it's not in use. Even if the charger is plugged in and the laptop is off, it draws power. This is called ghost or vampire, vampi vampire power by some uh, techies. What about desktops? <clears throat> PG&E recommends that you shut your computer down during the day when you will use it will not use it for the next two hours. Unplug the computer or switch off its power strip after it powers down. Also turn off your monitor for savings. <clears throat> As we, when we get through uh, the energy discussion, we'll come back to more energy saving tips. This chart shows the global commercial energy sources. So this is where we get our energy sources around the globe. This does not include energy collected for personal use or traded in informal markets. So this is kind of the open market. <clears throat> so you can see oil, <clears throat> oil, gas, 
coal and gas is about most of it. Um, nuclear is 5%, hydroelectric power is about 6%, and wind is a little sliver about 1%. This is the, um, from the previous um, edition, the U.S. energy consumption and the percentage of how it breaks out. <clears throat> and this pie chart shows the U.S. energy use sectors. So basically it takes a lot of energy to maintain our way of life. And Clearly, energy consumption is linked to the comfort and convenience of our lives. When I teach a class, I ask how long uh, the students would like to have their energy <coughs> turned off. And I start with, you know, a few minutes to a half hour. Most people can tolerate that. I start with an hour, and then a few hands disappear. And when I start going two, three, four, five hours, most most hands in the room disappear. So think about a day, think about a week, um, think about longer than that, um, especially in our wired world. Um, we really depend on reliable power. <clears throat> One thing's interesting that I find interesting is that the richer countries enjoy um, these amenities that are not available to most of the people in the world. Um, but several European countries, um, including Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, have higher standards of living as measured against the United States with about half of the energy consumption. So I find that intriguing. This is a chart that I put together that looks at electricity costs. I use it in my, one of my in my alternative energy lab in biology, and this is the cost per kilowatt hour of the different conventional and renewable energy sources. And what this would, if you're the way to interpret this chart is if 100% of your energy came from each of these resources that are on the left here, your, the cost to you to purchase that energy retail per kilowatt hour is shown on the right. So I think this is an interesting chart and I try to keep confirm the numbers from time to time as energy prices fluctuate. But just scan down that chart real quickly and see what um, the conventional and renewable energy sources cost. And it'll give you an idea of, of kind of where we are with energy policy. Um, do you, the one question I would ask is, do you know how much you pay for electricity? It's displayed in your energy bill. So next time you pull out, get your PG&E energy bill out, look at your average cost per kilowatt hour of what you're actually play, paying here in uh, this county. <coughs> so I also put this chart up about oil imports. So this is oil imports for mostly transportation, not electricity. But this is... Um, how many, uh, starting with January 2011 up to July of 2012, the, um, the oil imports that we're importing per day and the contribution of suppliers. We'll go into that a little bit more. <coughs> This is another chart uh, showing the top 10 U.S. oil suppliers. And this is up to 2012 data, so it's a little bit more updated than some of the tables in your book. And that illustrates kind of what's shown on this diagram. In terms of energy, you know, we have to look at 
um, recoverable resources, non-recoverable resources, the degree of economic feasibility of those recoverable resources. And so in energy planning, we're constantly looking at how much we have, how recoverable it is, how much that costs, and um, <clears throat> what the future undiscovered resources might be. So this is a, a map that I think is interesting because it basically charts the world's fuel and mineral resources. So you can kind of study that in your book. <clears throat> so let's go through the different conventional energy sources. And just looking ahead, uh, chapter 20 looks at renewable energy sources. So we're this chapter, we're focusing on conventional energy. So coal is the first one we're going to cover. Um, <clears throat> Coal is fossilized plant material that's been preserved by burial and sediments and compacted and condensed by geologic forces into a carbon-rich fuel. Most of our coal comes from the Carboniferous period, so it's ancient and it's not renewable. Um, 286 million to 360 million years ago. <coughs> So one of the attractions of coal, in spite of the downsides, is that it's vast. Um, and North America is particularly rich in it, but there are lots of other uh, countries, Europe and Eurasia and A the Asia Pacific, that also have coal reserves. So our resources are vast. They're long-lasting. but it's a dirty, dangerous business, and burning it also has downsides. So we're going to talk about that. So in terms of how we extract coal, we either do strip mining or um, deep mining. Strip mining or surface mining is cheaper and safer than underground mining, but often it makes the land unfit for any other use. Mine reclamation is now mandated in the United States, but land is rarely restored to its original contour or the biological community that was there before the mining began. Coal mining also contributes to water pollution. Sulfur and other water-soluble minerals make mine drainage and runoff from coal piles and mine tailings acidic and highly toxic. Thousands of miles of streams in the United States have been poisoned by coal mining operations. <clears throat> the most destructive type of strip mining is mountaintop removal. It's practiced mainly in the Appalachia, where tops of mountain ridges are scraped off and dumped into valleys below to get at coal seams. Streams, farms, and even whole towns have been buried under hundreds of meters of toxic rubble by this practice. Many people aren't aware that coal burning releases radioactivity in many toxic metals. Uranium, arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, rubidium, thallium, and zinc, um, along with a number of other elements, are absorbed by plants and concentrated in the process of coal formation. These elements are not destroyed when the coal is burned. They're released as gases and are concentra concentrated in um, the fly ash, that's kind of the ash that comes off the, the stacks of cold um, burning uh, plants. And also the bottom slag, that's the stuff that's cleaned out of the boilers. You're likely to get a higher dose of radiation living next door to a cold burning power plant than living next to a nuclear plant under normal conditions. Coal combustion is responsible for about 25% of all the atmospheric mercury pollution in the United States. Coal burning also leaves mountains of waste. One of the more interesting um, comparisons I heard at an engineers meeting was that um, the amount of coal waste in terms of size is mountainous, mountains of, of waste. Nuclear waste, which is not an insignificant problem, and we'll talk about that, but the 
nuclear waste is about the size of a refrigerator for each plant. Okay, so let's look at oil. So petroleum is formed in a similar way to oil. It's organic material buried in sediment that's subject to high pressure and temperature. It's mainly from aquatic organisms that died and sunk to the bottom of these water bodies, both marine and fresh. And then they decomposed and got compressed. But essentially, the oil it, oil is left over from all the lipids that were in the original organisms, the membranous parts of the organisms. An oil pool is usually um, composed of individual droplets or thin film permeating spaces in some kind of porous material like sandstone. So we recover about 30 to 40 percent of oil in a formation before it becomes uneconomic to continue. Like coal, petroleum is derived from these organic uh, substances that were created um, millions of years ago. Depending on its age and history, a petroleum deposit will have varying mixtures of oil, gas, and solid tar-like materials. Some of the very large deposits of heavy oils and tars are trapped in shales and sand deposits in the western areas of Canada and the United States. So this is another chart showing where our oil comes from. And you can see the distribution of, of countries there. Because of the increase in oil prices, it's, it has become more economical for um, US, the U.S. to actually do ultra-deep drilling. Um, and so this is a chart from your book that compares um, the different types of oil drilling platforms and the depths of the water that we can go to. And this is a projected uh, supply of um, oil and uh, gas uh, products over the next 25 years. So unlike coal, coal which has vast long-term reserves, you know, our, our petroleum resources are going to run out. Um, like other fossil fuels, oil has its negative impacts. Oil extraction isn't as destructive to landscapes as strip mining coal. But oil wells can be dirty and disruptive, as we learned in our own Gulf. Um, the largest remaining untapped land-based oil field in the United States is the Arctic National Wildlife Ref Refuge, also called ANWR or ANWR. And that is located in northeastern Alaska. <coughs> It's been, it's still off limits, but it's hotly debated whether we should start drilling there. Um, and it's also a valuable wildlife and wilderness area. Refining oil uh, releases high levels of air pollution. Some of the worst air quality in America is found near the heavy concentrations of petrochemical industries in Texas, Louisiana, New Jersey, and New Jersey. <coughs> probably hear on the news regularly about refinery and air pollution problems out in our Martinez area, where we have our own local refineries. BP, which is blamed for most of the bad decisions that led to the 2010 Gulf oil spill, has a terrible record of refinery operations. In the past three years, BP accounted for 97% of all the flagrant violations found in the refining industry. In 2005, an explosion at a BP Texas City refinery killed 15 workers and injured 117 others, 170 others. <clears throat> you also regularly hear reports about various refinery problems at Richmond and Martinez. 
So the Bay Area also supports an oil offloading and refinery industry. Because gas prices are higher these days, some of the more difficult technologies for extracting oil and gas are becoming more feasible. Also, the geopolitical difficulties of importing oil have become readily apparent in the past 10 years with two wars, among other conflicts. <coughs> Tar sands and oil shales contain about 10 times as much as the current conventional reserves that we have. So tar sands are composed of sand and shale particles, and they're coated with bitumen, a viscous mixture of long-chain hydrocarbons. So what you have to do is you have to pump steam down into these um, areas, and then you can extract the bitumen, which is that can then be refined. <coughs> this process creates toxic sludge and releases greenhouse gases also contaminates water and destroys um, boreal forests where in Canada, where most of these reserves are. So again, this, the environmental consequences of this are somewhat questionable. Um, now, this is not fracking, which is getting a lot of press in the United States. <coughs> we'll come back to fracking. So this is the current the world's oil reserves and what countries they can be found in. So now we're going to look at natural gas. So natural gas is the world's third largest commercial fuel. It's composed primarily of methane. Um, the advantage of natural gas is that when it's burned as a fossil fuel, it produces about half as much carbon dioxide as the same amount of coal or oil. So it um, is the most gra rapidly growing energy resource, but it has supply problems. So this is the proven natural gas resources. This is a chart showing the U.S. natural gas um, production. And you can see that the uh, shale gas is going to become more important. So this is a map of the eastern and midwestern United States showing where a lot of our shale gas is. The Marcellus and the Devonian shales underlie lie parts of the 10 eastern states um, that range from Georgia to New York. It's long been recognized that methane can be extracted from these formations, but estimates of recoverable amounts were relatively small. But new develops in ho developments in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, along with increased exploratory drilling, have now made this deposit deposit a potential e potentially economically viable option or super giant gas field. <clears throat> if all of it were recoverable, it would make a 100-year supply for the United States at current consumption rates. That's compared to about a 200-year about a supply of coal. The Utica shale, which lies below the Marcellus, could have even more methane. But the same issues concerning a multiple of wells, water pollution concerns, threats to water supplies, on um, which many people depend, raise thorny problems about this process. So this is another. Um, uh, map of the whole United States, because of course we're in the West, um, where shale gas uh, occurs. So, um, you know, some of the news that you hear about uh, hydraulic fracturing, which is the process to acquire this gas, and it's shortened to fracking, 
Um, you can see why Montana is kind of booming, and uh, North Dakota is and South Dakota are booming um, because <clears throat> this is an increasing uh, source of gas in the United States. So let's look at hydraulic fracturing, fracturing or fracking. So fracking involves drilling thousands of feet below the Earth's surface and pumping millions of gallons of water and chemical additives at high pressure into the well. <coughs> because the United States has large reserves of this type of gas, advocates say that American energy independence is a real possibility if the industry is given support. And that's currently happening. Conversely, environmental activists caution that the potential dangers of fracking have not been fully evaluated and may not be worth the risk. Moreover, fracking is currently exempt from the Clean Water Act that we talked about in the previous chapter. This kind of bothers me a lot. Instead, environmental activists say that the U.S. should focus on renewable energy sources, such as wind, solar, and biomass. Natural gas burning produces half the carbon dioxide compared to coal, which we talked about. But methane itself is a highly potent greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming. And it's routinely flared from the drilling sites and may also escape storage tanks. So the Environmental Defense Fund says that if these leaks aren't contained, natural gas is little better than coal in terms of its overall effect. Now let's look at LNG. So in many places, gas and oil are found together in sediments. So we extract the oil, and the gas comes with it. This gas is flared, that is, it's burned off. and just for no productive energy work. It's just burned off. So, and it's a big waste. So one, another idea is that this gas could be liquefied, that is, cooled, so it could be shipped. And um, there are special, uh, what, this is called liquefied natural gas. And this is another area of energy that some people feel is promising. So these special liquefied natural gas, or they call them LNG, tankers um, can ship this gas around. Um, there are problems with this as well. A fully loaded LNG ship contains about as much energy as a medium-sized atomic bomb. And huge amounts of seawater are used to warm and regasify the LNG when it arrives at its offloading port. So this could have uh, effects on coastal ecology. <coughs> uh, LNG um, terminal siting is currently regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as a result. So US gets some LNG from different countries around the world, and about 1.5% of the U.S. gas supply comes from LNG. There's a lot of LNG terminals that are in the works, but they really haven't um, been built yet. Another type of gas resource is methane hydrate. These are small individual molecules of natural gas that are tra trapped in a matrix of frozen water. And they're found in the Arctic and uh, beneath uh, the ocean. Um, so this might be another uh, source, but it's also, also difficult to extract, store, and ship. And any escaped methane into the ocean is not going to be good. Um, methane is also uh, can be extracted from landfills. Um, in our own Ox Mountain landfill, we have a methane extraction facility that generates some power. Let's look at nuclear power. Um, in the 1950s, we thought nuclear power was going to be um, 
a choice, a, a source of uh, cheap electrical generation. And between 1970 and 1974, um, American utilities ordered 140 new reactors for power plants, but construction costs were high and there were also safety fears. Um, when Three Mile Isle, when Three Mile Island happened, that really um, changed the picture for the nuclear power in industry. Even with current plants, in the light of the 2011 disaster in Japan, officials in many countries are re-examining their commitment to nuclear power. According to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the riskiest facility in the United States is the one shown in this picture here, the Indian Point Generating Station, which is just 24 miles up the Hudson River from New York. This plant is estimated to have 1 in 10,000 chance of a core, core damage from an earthquake. And being so close to New York City, you, that could be um, quite a problem. I've also included an aerial view of our own local, that is local to our service territory, um, pg and Diablo Canyon power plant near San Luis Obispo. This chart shows um, the uh, way that nuclear power has changed in the United States. So um, the current plants in operation are static and there's no new nuclear power um, plants planned uh, in, the U in the United States at the moment. So your book um, gives you a fairly detailed description of the parts of a nuclear power plant, the nuclear fuel cycle. I'll let you study that if um, you're interested in nuclear power. Um, I put the refrigerator and the coal mine idea on this slide. Um, the uh, biggest problem with nuclear power is um, the fact that an um, accident could cause a core meltdown. Um, this is what's called a cooling system failure. And although these uh, plants have very um, redundant systems and a lot of controls and a lot of oversight, um, it could happen, as we learned in the recent um, Fukushima accident in Japan. The other um, big issue is the disposal of nuclear waste. There's currently no nuclear waste de depository even established for the United States, even though it's been work we've been working on it for years now. <clears throat> this is another view of Diablo Canyon. And um, it basically uses ocean water as its coolant. Um, and so it draws in ocean water. Um, you're looking at the outlet in the main part of the picture. And if you look a little to the right, there's the intake cove. And so the intake is a little bit um, further right, to your right in this picture on the side of the plant. The U.S. is actually the world's largest producer of nuclear power, and it accounts for more than 30% of the worldwide nuclear generating, generation capacity. Um, we currently have 104 nuclear reactors, um, and uh, very few new ones are built. Nuclear power is getting a little bit of a resurgence because of uh, the concerns over climate change. Um, again, your book goes into how nuclear reactors work, but the common fuel is uranium-235. Um, it's basically put in these cylindrical pellets, which are stacked in metal rods, and then the 
rods are assembled together, and that's called a fuel assembly. Thousands of these assemblies <coughs> are bundled in a um, reactor core, and then the actual energy is produced by nuclear fission that's illustrated in this um, chart. And uh, we control the the way the reaction works by keeping the temperature, the heat released from the um, reaction to a level that um, the temperature uh, doesn't get too high. So there's an uncontrolled um, reaction that would melt the actual fuel rods. So uh, we don't have storage for radioactive wastes. And um, there are waste storage facilities at each plant, including Diablo Canyon. The spent fuel assemblies are stored in these water-filled pools at the power plants. That was supposed to be temporary, and then we were supposed to find a long-term solution to this, which we have yet to do. Um, most plants have only a 30-year operating life, so many of the plants that have been built are heading towards what we call decommissioning, which means the plants are shut down and all the radioactive waste is supposedly uh, permanently stored somewhere. Um, but uh, decommissioning is quite expensive, so there's concern about that. Um, PG&E has applied to the nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC, to operate Diablo Canyon for another 20 years. You probably hear a lot about nuclear fusion. Um, nuclear fusion, if you can get it, the reaction started, is um, <coughs> supposedly safer. Um, but the technology really isn't there yet. Temperatures have to be raised so high to get it started that you almost put more energy in than you get out in fusion. Um, so we haven't really developed this technology. So this is a chart I put together going back to um, the different conventional energy sources here. And um, as a summary, I've added the costs again, and I've added the uh, an availability and a location uh, descriptor, and also sort of a simple rating system on the environmental impacts. I think what you're uh, getting the idea of so far as you read the chapter is that this energy picture is complicated, and you know there's cost availability, you know, whether we import and depend on other countries, um, environmental um, issues to think of, and it's, it's not as easy as one would think. Um, so kind of study this a little bit. Um, I've rated the environmental uh, column you see here of a um, the greenhouse gas, whether it's um, plus or minus or plus or zero. So zero greenhouse gases from climate change would be um, the most desirable. And then I've also given a relative um, environmental assessment, looking at all the other environmental issues. So negative means negative environmental, positive means sort of a, a net positive from what our current sort of impact levels are. Um, the next chapter talks about fuel cells, and I included it on this chart. And I'll also include a similar table when we look at renewable energy. Fuel, the reason why I include fuel cells on both is that fuel cells um, are discussed in the next chapter, but they can run on natural gas. So fuel cells is a, another technology that is potentially promising. Um, that's cleaner than conventional fossil fuel um, burning. 
I included this chart from a previous edition so you could go back to this idea that is mentioned but without a lot of details in your book that certain countries um, have higher standards of living but lower energy consumption. So this is something you may want to look up or study a little bit and compare lifestyles in some of these countries compared to ours. So um, this is the last slide. So um, in conclusion, our energy future is far from certain. We have probably used half of the easily accessible liquid petroleum reserves in the world and at this point. And this has provided a lifestyle of luxury and convenience for those of us lucky enough to live here. Um, it's created a lot of environmental problems that we're still wrestling with. And some of these we've studied, acid rain, strip mined landscapes, massive oil spills, uh, payments to unstable co countries, <clears throat> and perhaps the ultimate uh, one is global climate change. There are still very large supplies of unconventional fossil fuels, star tar sands, oil shale, coal bed methane, um, hydraulic fracturing, and methane hydrates. But the environmental costs of extracting these resources are high too. So what do we do? Um, there is potential future technological promise, but we've talked about the fact that the IGCC plants are currently not um, all that feasible. There are not that many of them. Nuclear power has its problems, and fusion is um, too far out there to really think about now. Um, Many argue that we ought to immediately move towards conservation and renewable energy, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. So it's important to understand the picture of our fossil conventional energy sources and the renewable energy sources that we're going to talk about next.